This is Daniela Camboni for Stansberry Investor and joining me today, he's back, Vince Lancy. He's the founder of Echo Bay Partners. He's also a frequent contributor to Zero Hedge. Vince, welcome back to Stansberry Investor. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for having me back. Okay. First and foremost, I need to thank you because I think you're our biggest fan out there. <laughs> um, you've done an incredible analysis of the historic debate that took place on Stansberry Research of Bitcoin versus gold, Frank Joostra versus Michael Saylor. Um, everyone has seen it. If you haven't, I don't know where you've been living, <laughs> but if you follow these two markets, it's a mm -hmm. must watch. And Vince, what you've done is a deep dive analysis. You broke out clips. You've been posting all over Twitter. So thank you for that. Sure. And I wanted to bring you on to, to to have a conversation about this because you 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 were there for me uh, throughout the debate mentoring me and oh. and and um and helping and i just want to get your thoughts on on takeaways and i thought my first question to you would be because i know you're in gold and bitcoin long time in gold obviously um did it manage to change your mind on anything yeah that's um <clears throat> that is the ultimate question right when you're asking someone who has an opinion and uh, uh, I saw a lot of people did not have their minds changed. It was almost like a political conversation, but mine was uh, more cemented in both camps. Meaning I feel, I feel like I can see the path forward uh, a lot better on both sides. Uh, my opinion is, is not changed. Uh, uh, it's, uh, my opinion is bilateral. I'm not one, I'm both, so. Right, but you were saying that perhaps you're a bit more convinced of your ownership in Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, I did say that. Um, yes, um, the reason for that is, you know, I'm not so sure it was the focus of the debate, but you know, I've seen a debate like three or four times now. And by the third time in, I started focusing on things that were not subtle, but were uh, of great importance to lawmakers, accountants, uh, as well as asset investors. And those things made me realize that beyond the technology and beyond the implications of, say, decentralized finance or, or uh, the disintermediation of banks, Bitcoin has a place, regardless of what happens to it, in uh, the broader financial markets. And it's not, it's not going to zero, is what I'm saying. Okay, so let's talk about uh, strengths from the debate, um, some strong points you heard um, or recall fr from both sides, you know, we started with Bitcoin here. So what cemented it for you thinking like, you know, Bitcoin's really here to stay? Michael Saylor is, um, uh, you know, is far uh, smarter than most people that I know. Um, uh, he, he approaches things, uh, at least in his, in most of his conversations, I've seen him speak to mainstream media and I've seen him speak to uh, uh, Bitcoin maxis. And the, the debate was actually, he was neither one of those personas, and I, I kind of enjoyed it for that reason. He, you know, he did his he did his his uh, uh, his analogies and his metaphors, and 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 that's fine. You have to do that with an audience that may not understand the, the nitty gritty of, of an asset of a product. Uh, but he also, uh, you know, I think he kind of showed a little. Uh, the expression is alpha. He talked about the asset as being an asset, not a currency. That's big. Uh, that that has to do with tax implications. And, and that's you know, a fiscal statement saying that Bitcoin's not out to replace fiat uh, as money. That's one thing that was just glossed over. The second thing was he started talking for about, and this is really, you know, I, I get kind of like really deep on this, but by the third time I, I saw the interview, he was talking about for a very brief period of time, he's talking about what I call term structure. He's talking about money markets uh, and, uh, you know, uh, interest rates. And for him to focus on that, even for a minute or two, told me that there are things in the offing that are going to make it an even more viable product. And then finally, MicroStrategy has relationships with all these companies as, as um, advisor. So at some point, uh, you know, him owning Bitcoin is proof of concept. And the clients that trust his company are going to, I think, be advised for the right reason to use Bitcoin or a product like that. So I, I don't think, uh, I think it's a, I think Bitcoin is a tool in Michael Saylor's hands. And if you take the marketing out of it, it's still a tool. It's a good tool. Let's talk about the point he brought up, which I, I thought was a strong point of the debate um, of miners and their gold ownership. He specifically pointed to Newmont and Barrick. Newmont mining. 
11 billion dollars in revenue has 5.5 billion in cash ebitda of 5.7 billion last year paid a massive dividend a dollar 45 they actually mine gold at 750 to a thousand dollars an ounce they've returned 2.7 billion to their shareholders they paid seven and four million in taxes they're dividing it out 40 to 60 percent of the free cash flow above 1200 dollars an ounce they have effectively zero net debt and yet they borrowed a billion 985 million dollars at 225 basis points last year they could borrow five to ten billion more what does this mean it means they're mining gold as fast as they can so that they can buy cash they don't even think it's worth they they could buy 10 billion dollars of gold for two and a half percent interest they don't think the gold is going up they think the gold is going back to 1200 these gold miners don't believe in gold they don't have any gold on their balance sheet they could borrow 20 billion dollars at three percent interest and buy gold if they believed in it they don't believe in it you know he's saying they're paying double tax income plus dividend to avoid holding gold on their balance sheets when their cost of capital is potentially less than three percent um, did he make his point there? Yeah, um, you, my first reaction as a, as, a, as a person who thinks about risk as a trader was, yeah, that's a spot on statement to make. If you're bullish uh, what your business is, then you're longing. Uh, uh, and that's something that I will frequently say about people that are just in the business of selling, uh, not in ad adding value to it. <clears throat> but I thought about it a little bit longer and there was something wrong with it, uh, at least as an analogy. We'll take the analogy to its conclusion. If I'm a miner and I mine gold and I sell gold for my business, then you can make the case, as Michael did, that I'm not bullish on my own asset. I'm shorting my own asset. Well, then can't you make the same case about any company that goes public? And isn't that what MicroStrategy did? Are you not cashing out at least a part of your asset? It's the same concept. If you want to talk about gold, I'm not selling my Bitcoin, I'm buying my Bitcoin. Yeah, but you're selling your shares. The same concept. So you're saying the so, miners don't have to have gold on their balance sheets. Like their their job is to make shareholder money. Right. Shareholder they have. Well, yes, and and that's and that's that was my 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 overview comment. You know, the parallel is selling your gold is no different financially or or as a confidence play in 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 issuing shares to go public. Why would you go public if you were, if you were bullish on yourself? And and I understand the answer around that. But the, the the thing that you're saying, the other thing that you're saying, that's a very good point. That's also counterable. If you own a mine, you own gold. It's in the ground. It's proven. You own it. So for you to, if I'm a miner and I'm not, if you for you to tell me that I'm shorting gold by pulling it out of the ground and selling it, that may be that that's not true because I take business risk by owning the mine, which is made of gold. I think it's a viable business. The risk that I'm not taking is market risk. I want to be hedged on my gold. Do you think uh, Michael did a good job? You know, like Frank had a lot of strong statements when it came to the risks associated with Bitcoin. Um, obviously the price volatility, the unproven uh, track record that it has such a short history that governments can't step in. Did, did Michael make you feel better with his responses? Because those are common risks we hear when we're talking about long-term Bitcoin investing here. I was impressed on, on a couple levels. And, and the one level I'll say is that he addressed not the literal uh, negatives, potential negatives and risks. He addressed the positives that countered it. So uh, I, think, I think Michael um, uh, did a really good job of uh, defending the positives without uh, getting too mired in the negatives, potential negatives, I should say. Uh, you know, Frank's main point, right, is that Michael needs to chip away at gold's $10 trillion market cap to keep the Bitcoin narrative alive. You're trying to create a narrative for a higher price for Bitcoin. And in order to do that, you need to convince everyone out there that gold is worthless and all of that value that currently, currently resides in gold will be all transferred, all $12 trillion of it will be transferred to Bitcoin. What do you think of that? Is there truth to that? Does Bitcoin need gold That's, uh, to keep the momentum could, going yeah, here? I'm going to, you might like this answer. Um, that, what Michael, Frank, what Frank, I'll, I'll, I'll pretend that I'm Michael and respond to that. 
you're right. I believe in what I'm doing. I have skin in the game. I think gold is a bad uh, uh, substitution for Bitcoin at the inflation currency debasement level. So Frank's right, you know, uh, in the sense that Michael is, Michael is uh, going after, right? I mean, he, he, does he have a plan to do that? I don't know, but does he really, I mean, all he's doing is you can't really push a, a rock up a hill. <clears throat> the rock for gold investment is at the edge of a hill and it's about to be pushed down. And, and Michael, I think, is nudging conceptually what has already been on people's minds. You know, gold doesn't do what it should. And, you know, I'm, I'm a gold bull, right? Gold doesn't do what it should for whatever reason you want to talk about. And Bitcoin, maybe for the wrong reasons, is doing what gold should be doing. So what, what I mean by that is, 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 is Michael using the vulnerability of gold as an investment that hedges inflation uh, against it and in doing that juxtaposing it with with bitcoin as a as a less favorable asset to own to hedge these risks yes uh does he have skin in the game to that effect yes um uh, is he is he selling because he doesn't believe in it doesn't look that way is he selling because he believes in it yes so i, I have to think that uh, while he may be uh maybe picking on gold because gold can't defend itself, right? Uh, uh, there, there's no one on CNBC going, uh, let's defend gold, uh, <laughs> you know, right? And, and not to mention and what Frank said, you know, I think Frank made a comment that was also great. He said, he said, yeah, the, the government probably likes the fact that he's bashing gold. That's true. You know, I, that's, that's a trade that I want to do. Uh, uh, but um, I mean, it, it's, I, I think Frank's main point was you're not discussing this in a balanced way about what the risks are. Right, right, right. And right. I'll be Michael, I'll be Michael and I'll say, well, that's not my job. They're not asking me the right questions. And, and I don't mean that negatively. But, but let, let's, let's, let's elaborate on that because that's, a, that's an important point that, that I believe Frank was trying to make there is that you can't be pushing this agenda and I'm not saying Michael is or was, but you know, the Bitcoin camp of let's place all our eggs in one basket and, and right. here lies the, the huge risk or mm -hmm. don't just jump on the ba Bitcoin bandwagon because your neighbor is, is doing it. Like really understand why you are investing in, in this asset. So, right. Right. Um, so, so I think therein lies the, the greater risk or the point that, that Frank was trying to make. Yeah. Um, any other uh, thoughts on, on the debate, uh, Vince? You takeaways? You did the eggs in the basket analogy, and that reminded me of something that I think is relevant. If, if, if you want to look at it in terms of hedging your own portfolio risk on a personal level, Michael is saying, put all your eggs in one basket. If you want to just take that position for a moment, and Frank is saying, be diversified in your hedges. And these are two schools of thought, and both are accurate. One is diversify your portfolio against risk. The other is, meaning don't put all your eggs in one basket. The other is, put all your eggs in one basket and watch that basket closely. And that's what Michael's doing. He's saying, I know this, I'm betting on it, and I'm all in. That's, that's a maximalist. So what's Vince doing with his eggs? <laughs> uh, like your, your, your focus these days, are, are, you, are you preferring to focus on one asset and put full concentration on this? Or do you feel in this current economic environment, you're best to be diversified? Oh, well, yeah, uh, if you wanna, I'll just throw numbers at you. If, if 10% of my portfolio is in inflationary edges. Let's say it was 8%, 2%, 8% uh, gold and 2% Bitcoin. Well, now it's 7%, 3%. Gotcha. gotcha. You know? But okay. it wasn't necessarily Bitcoin that I bought. Good thoughts, Vince. Before I let you go, how can I not ask you about the silver squeeze? It's May Day. Everyone's, you know, I, I see what's happening on Twitter. People trying to rile up the troops and say buy silver before May first. Uh, what's going on here with the silver squeeze? Any any thoughts? Uh, my thought would be if I were a trader on J.P. Morgan's desk, I'd be watching it closely. Yeah. Meaning, okay. meaning, if it gets traction, yeah, then I know that I should be covering more of my shorts. And after we keep a lid on it, uh, we'll take it higher six months from now when we're ready for it. Yeah, but, wonder, you know, something going on. Paying attention. Yeah, it will be interesting to see unfold. We'll sure. be watching it closely. Uh, Vince, again, thank you uh, for all your analysis on this debate. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me.
And thanks for watching. We'll have much more for you on Stansberry Investor. In the meantime, remember to share us where you watch us. That's it for me. I'm Daniela Camboni. Bye.